All right, let's get started. Thank you for spending your afternoon with me. I know you have a choice of some excellent talks this afternoon. Um, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, this is starting your cloud native journey. Uh, so who's new here in open source? I see some people that have been around the block a few times. And how many of you are, are, are experienced? OK. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our industry and cloud native in general. And so hello, OSS Summit. I did promise that there will be dinosaurs in this talk. A little bit about myself. Uh, my name is George Castro, uh, Puerto Rican, grew up in Puerto Rico. So my name technically is Jorge, but I keep confusing white people. So we're just going to go with George uh, for a little while in order to avoid confusion. Um, I live in Ann Arbor with my wife, Jill, my son, Rafael, who's seven, who's a miniature version of me, and my beagle, Oscar, who is a dog version of me. Uh, so we're a very, very loud family. Like I said, I'm Puerto Rican. I will be talking with my hands during most of this session. Uh, I come from an ops background. I went to Michigan State University, uh, did the Army for about four years, got out, did tech, worked at a small university called Oakland University in Rochester Hills, Michigan, where I, during the great Unix to Linux migration, uh, so that was a lot of fun and got involved there directly, uh, ripping out things like Solaris and replacing them with something called Debian at the time. And that led me to Ubuntu, and that's how I got into tech. So I worked on Ubuntu at Canonical for about 15 years, moved on to Kubernetes, Kubeflow, Cloud Custodian, and now all of you, literally all of you. Uh, my job is about ecosystems. Technically, my job is developer relations on the project team at the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the CNCF, uh, which is part of the Linux Foundation. So my job isn't about ecosystems. And I'm coming, I'm about to come up on my first year here at the CNCF um, after taking a sabbatical, which I will be talking about a little bit. Um, however, I've only given two or three talks since then. So in a way, I'm glad that this is a very intimate conversation. So I appeal to your empathy uh, today. Uh, my favorite part about Cloud Native is that um, you can just be yourself. And it's, it's, it's that family. And I'm really glad to see some of you here because I am going to be talking about things that I feel are important and are large and complex and nuanced problems that we need to solve. And I had this talk finished. It was done. And I spent some time uh, with Jeremy here on the very first day talking about the modern challenges that we face as developer relations, as open source maintainers and contributors. And um, stayed up until 3 AM rewriting the entire thing. Um, so I had this talk finished. It was done. Um, then I realized that this is important, and we have to start having these conversations. And if I got to rewrite this talk 15 times, then I got to rewrite the talk 15 times. Um, so let's go. We're going for it. In Cloud Native, we call this YOLO, which is how we run our systems in production. Um, but I did promise that uh, you are, there will be dinosaurs in this talk. Um, so I need you to check some assumptions at the door, and we're going to try to have a little bit of fun. So does anybody know what this, there will be some audience participation in this talk. Uh, does anybody know what this creature is? Anywhere close? No clue. It looks like an ostrich, a mega ostrich. OK. <laughs> Do you think it eats meat or plants? Plants. Humans. The human's there for scale, Jeremy. I mean, unless you've seen one of these. <laughs> this is called a therizinosaur, and that'll be more important later on. So worst case, if you talk about open source and you don't like any of my ideas, you'll at least learn about dinosaurs. They'll become more important later on. So first, uh, let's get the business stuff done. Uh, this is the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is an umbrella organization that holds many projects. Uh, Kubernetes, Prometheus, Open Tracing, Fluentd, I could just list them on and on and on. Some of you have worked on these projects, right? Raise your hand if you've worked on any CNCF project or have or adjacently been involved. All right. Um, so these are the graduated projects. Uh, and our global mission is just to make cloud native ubiquitous. That means everywhere. Um, Linux, open source, we've eaten the world. So. Part of this talk will be how we move from that hyper growth era into that sustainability era, which is on top of any, all of our minds. So we host 184 open source projects. 
Uh, these are the graduated ones and the incubating ones. We have what we call maturity levels in the CNCF. So graduated are the projects that have been around and have been um, gone through certain criteria and the community has deemed them ready for production. Incubating is one step down. And then we have the sandbox, which is everything else. Um, so as you can see, it's an overwhelming amount of projects. In fact, so much so that um, the CNCF landscape has kind of become a meme. So I'm this guy, you know. Uh, so I know what you're thinking, and all these talks are kind of samey. So I'm going to shake things up. That's why I'm bringing in the dinosaurs and all that stuff. Um, but we are working on making some great tooling to make all of our lives easier. Uh, that the amount of projects and innovation that open source developers continue to uh, make um, really isn't slowing down. And I forgot to set my timer. All right, let's go. Um, jokes aside, now that I have to help maintain this thing, uh, it's a great lens it's into what's out there, right? Uh, it's a great place to see what people are working on, what's hot, and um, yeah, it's pretty great, but it's also pretty funny. Uh, it's like a huge herd of dinosaurs. So I'm going to explain the CNCF with these circular diagrams that someone who is not a nerd clearly made, but I like to explain this chart as the money, the nerds, and the consumers from left to right. So we have a governing board, the Technical Oversight Committee, who has public meetings that you can attend. Underneath them are technical advisory groups that help them do stuff. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail into what this is. Do stuff is the technical term. And then we have the end user community, which is something I would like to bring into this talk as well, because they also hold a critical part of this ecosystem. So we're see, people see projects I see organisms. I see large and diverse ecosystem of amazing projects, people, and organizations. And keeping them healthy is critical to modern society, right? If none of this stuff works, the next day is zombies, right? Every zombie movie that you've seen the day before, an open source maintainer <laughs> orphaned a project. That's, that's, what I, that's what I like to think. So I didn't just want to list how to get started in open source and give you a bunch of bullets and show you a bunch of links, because those days are over. Um, in this talk, I want to explain we're contributing to modern, modern open source fits and how much we need to change our outlook, our approach. And make no mistake, we are heading into a new epoch of open source, where we must adapt to the rigors of a new environment. And that environment is usually out of our control as individual contributors. So how do we fit into this ecosystem? Because every creature in an ecosystem fits somewhere for a purpose, right? Things don't just exist. They occupy a niche in an ecosystem. They have a purpose. Can anyone guess what this dinosaur is? It's a relatively famous one. Stegosaurus, all right. How about this one? Famous more recently. This is called a Carnotaurus, one of my favorite um, animals. And you might have heard the analogy before that you are closer to Cleopatra was than in time than to Cleopatra was to the creation of the pyramids. That's an analogy that we use to kind of explain to our feeble primate brains a concept called deep time. This is what geologists and scientists do when they're explaining the history of the entire earth, right? Our civilization, what? 10,000 BC up to now, 15, give it, I don't know, 15,000 year, years versus the billions of years that the planet has existed. So we are closer to this Carnotaurus in time than this Carnotaurus is to the Stegosaurus. That's the scale that I'm talking about. And I, the reason I picked dinosaurs and the natural environment as my analogy is that is the level of long-term thinking that we need, the mindset that we need to do. However, as humans, we struggle with this concept. So I wanted to get that out of the way. So we have real time. We have our, our brains just can't comprehend deep time well. So we have to be explicit when we are studying and thinking about how we're going to think about um, uh, open source as a long-term sustainability project. So when you see kids playing with dinosaurs, 
right? And you go to the store and you say, my kid loves dinosaurs. They get a bag of dinosaurs and then they pour them out, right? And then they look and then as a dinosaur nerd, you look at this bag or a paleontologist looks at it. It's just a bag of contradictions, right? It's like things are different species. Most of them are designed wrong, right? Most of them are based on what we thought dinosaurs were in the 60s. They don't make sense. They're millions of years apart. Yet to the general American who, or Westerner who goes to see Jurassic Park, all these things lived at the same time, right? Um, and in a lot of ways, people consume open source that same way. It's all the same, isn't it? Right? So yet the allure of these creatures continues to endure, right, despite the popular view of dinosaurs, right? And I also wonder, like, do paleontologists, paleontologists do, like, the well, actually thing that we do because we're Linux nerds? Um, but I do want to explain a little bit about our culture and how that fits and where, where did my notes go? Um, so it really, all right, so my notes are missing. So it starts off with our culture, that culture of collaboration and everything that has taken us through the first era of open source. And what I have noticed is our culture at first was very much geared towards hyper growth, that competitiveness, right? My first 15 years in this industry was how are we going to get people to use Linux, right? And then now, I think about it now, and it was like, there was a time where we, like you had to make a case to use Linux in the first place, you know? Now, it's not whether or not we're gonna use and consume Linux, open source, Kubernetes, whatever you're into, but how do we do that smarter and with long-term thinking? And that's all about getting contributors on board. But why do we participate in the first place? Anyone have any ideas? Why do people participate in open source, do you think? Belonging. Belonging, good one. Any others? Community, always a good one. One of my favorite words, because it's the answer to every question in open source. How do we solve this? Community. Who's the problem? Community, okay. So there are several reasons to participate. I'm gonna, I'm gonna highlight some of my favorites here. Um, career advancement, you know, especially those, uh, those of us that have been involved in open source in a professional uh, capacity, being involved in open source um, was a great career move. I had two choices in my life. I remembered I can either learn Linux or I can continue to be an exchange mail administrator. I think I made the right choice. Um, but someone decided not to do that, and they're probably pretty happy as well. Come on. Um, personal interest. Some of us are just nerds. Some of us are just nerds. Um, and uh, you're, you're, you're a geek, right? You, you feel like you belong. We are kind of very proud of our culture as far as when it comes to the kind of people that we are. Uh, but I do want to talk about the person who says it's just a job. I have known so many great open source contributors that aren't the kind of people that would stand up here and talk passionately about contributors and all of that stuff. To them, look, I got a great job. I show up at 9. 9 a.m., I commit to stuff to Git, 5 o'clock comes, I love you all, but I'm out, right? And I'm always also cognizant of, you know, especially hanging out with friends, uh, that they don't want to be as passionate as I am. They just want to move on with their lives. However, there is a large group of us that only want this to just be a job, and I'll get into that in a little bit. And then there's people like me where it is more than a job, it might even be a major part of your identity, as you can see before you. Um, but it is about scoping yourself. Uh, this is something, uh, those, those of you getting into open source, one of my mentors, Tim Pepper, uh, told me something really interesting. We were hanging out at KubeCon in Paris, having a very nice dinner, and he was mentioning a project, and I don't even remember the project that he was talking about or the problem that he was trying to solve. Because the way he started it was blah, 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 blah. There was a project, because I forgot all this part. And I really want to get involved and fix it, fix it. And I remember in my brain thinking, I all, this always happens to me. So in my head, I immediately start, what do I start to think? Who are the project maintainers? When's the last time they did a release? Where's their GitHub page? Let me check it out. Let me put that thing in the crowd.dev. Let me see how it's looking. Are the numbers going up and to the right? Are people leaving? What's the average 
you know, are they new? Are they mature? All these kinds of things. This is, I'm, my brain is going at a million miles an hour thinking of all the ways I wanted to help that project. Um, he just simply said, you know, but I really haven't thought on how I'm going to approach it until, you know, I finish, I finish my end state. I was like, what do you mean your end state? He goes, well, I've decided that every single time I look at a project or contributing, um, I start with the criteria that would allow me to leave the project and emeritus myself so that someone else could take over. I'm not even going to spend the mental energy to figure out how exactly I'm going to solve that problem until I've defined a set of criteria for myself and convinced myself that the project will be in a state where I can remove myself and in good hands if I can accomplish these four or five things. Totally different, totally backwards. And then he kept talking, and because I'm ADHD, I was just staring off into space thinking, Tim Pepper is so insightful sometimes. And that's one of the great things about communities and mentors and things like that. I had gotten so used, I'm 25 years into this gig, and I've gotten so used to my little run book, right, that the possibility of even thinking about how am I going to leave this project never came up. And that explains a lot of things that has happened to me. Because it's all about avoiding that trap. And it absolutely is a trap. That trap is burnout. I burned down on Ubuntu. I burned out on Kubernetes, I burned out on Kubeflow, and I burned out on Cloud Custodian. It got so bad towards the end, despite what I consider a pretty awesome career, meeting awesome people, getting to give talks like this, uh, that I went on sabbatical. I took three months off. I told my wife, I've had it. I don't know my place in the ecosystem. Do I even know how to do my job? Right? Things were getting bad. Being in DevRel the past few years has been challenging for our friends. Right? And as a community, I couldn't help but feel the tang of failure that during the successful times, had we failed to make the economic argument of the importance of open source. And this bothered me. And it took me three months of staring into fire and playing video games to kind of think, how am I going to approach this? And I took a different approach. I started to think about how athletes approach things. I'm very much into F1. And I started to think about when Lewis Hamilton, after winning seven championships, then doesn't win one. How does he get back into the car, right? And I struggled with this. I got on a lot of phones, used my personal network, my friends, the people that had helped get me into this industry in the first place. And what I did find out is we're all kind of in the same boat a little bit, you know? So when I hear things like that as an open source person, I immediately default to, we can do this together. So now that I'm working on 184 projects, knowing that I've burnt out on four, <laughs> right, three of which are in that list of 184, uh-oh, what have I done? Have I volunteered to burn myself out again? And as we say in Cloud Native, horizontal scalability is the ultimate solution, right? So if I'm going to fail, this time, I'm going to do it right. Um, like I said, YOLO. Because you're not a parent. You shouldn't have to be a parent, right? There are certain times where I am very passionate about being an open source contributor. And, but there are certain times where I do need to remind myself, man, Wayne was right. Nine to, I need to nine to five for the next month or I'm going to lose it. I'm a dad. You know, he's depending on me. Uh, you hear things from these books that you read where it's like, um, the only thing you're your kid is going to remember, you know, when you're not spending time with them watching grow up, grow up is that dad is working in the office. I don't want to be that person. Um, because working in open source, sometimes you have to be an engineer, a CTO, a psychologist, QA, CICD expert, security expert, community manager, developer relationships, and sometimes a babysitter. So we need to ensure that that culture is right. So I'm going to go back to this is all the good things you hear about being there for each other, inclusivity, diversity. We're proud of this community's strengths and work through these weaknesses together. And despite our problems, we find ways to move forward, right? There's a reason that modern society depends on this stuff. If we don't do our jobs, there will be zombies on the streets. No pressure. 
But we're also not immune to the changes in the industry, right? We must adapt. Our approaches must change. Ask anyone who's been in developer experience how they're doing. Things are different. Playbooks that worked six months ago, 12 months ago, sometimes don't work anymore. This talk literally didn't work <laughs> until the last hour, and I'm still not sure if, <laughs> if I'm doing it right. So that adaptability, that flexibility is uh, an important thing. Um, so we need to find our, we find ourselves needing to redefine what it means to be an open source contributor and maintainer while also keeping those values that have led to our success in the first place close to our hearts. But let's start by recognizing the need for this. Organizations are made of people. They're intrinsically linked, right? And we as people focus on the individual, but our society and our lives depend on us making a living for our families. And we depend on organizations to do that. And how did we end up taking over? Why did organizations choose open source and cloud native? Let's look at that for a little bit. So we know, I call this a great contradiction. We know that open source projects and maintainers take long-term investment and nurturing. But the organizations that we work for think per quarter. If there's one thing I want you to take from this talk today, it's that one of our primary roles as leaders and participants in open source is to ensure that this pattern is well known. Because navigating this new pattern and this new epoch is going to be critical to our success. So easy and, easy and quick open source can work, and it did for the, first, for the Triassic, right? And now that we're in that new epoch, some of the most successful species live on for millions of years in that deep time. But true long-term success uh, depends about that adaptability. So I'm going to talk about NICE. This is one of those awesome acronyms that organizations like the ones I work for come up with. Um, the value proposition for organizations investing in open source. The first one is networking. Uh, we tell organizations, show up to a KubeCon, an open source summit, and you will automatically be at a benefit because you get to talk to your peers of people that are using this technology, right? Go to, if you use gRPC, go to gRPC Conf, see how people are using it in anger. One of my favorite terms in open source, who's using this in anger, right? Um, so that networking effect can be beneficial as opposed to an organization or organizations that work insularly, right? I love it when to hear a manager say, I found a new open source project and I'm really glad because we were about to write our, we were about to write that entire thing, right? And in the early days I would say, well, what a waste of effort, you know? Just come hang out with the hippies, we'll do it for you. This, these days I lead with, wow, sounds expensive. It's a different nuanced take versus, hey, you should come hang out at KubeCon. It's a great time. You're going to love open source. I lead with the money. Impact. One of the greatest things about open source is these organizations can hop in, and then they can influence and make an impact on how the project is structured, features, bug fixes. The more you participate, the more influence you have. Some organizations do this better than others. In the first era of open source, we kind of concentrated on things that were close to us. Tech companies, the people producing the software, the people that hire the engineers to do these, these large organizations. The pattern I'm noticing in this new era, end user companies are now experts. They are becoming the people who are stressing the limits of the software. So to hang out with a Kubernetes developer and then a big bank shows up and says, yeah, we're using this thing for X amount of nodes. And then the open source, the maintainer's like, wow, I didn't design it for that many. Good to meet you too. It's like, wow, okay, neat. So that's the kind of networking and impact that we're looking for. And then comprehension. The more they get involved, the more expertise they learn in their companies. And when I say comprehension, it's not just for the individual developers, because the individual developers will, of course, learn the craft, learn the tooling, but that organizational knowledge on how to consume open source effectively is what they're looking for. And that's what they can learn. And then elevation. As you become a, more of an expert, of course, one of the things we're, we strive to do is put them on a stage, tell your story. Digital transformations. Everyone loves to hear it. Very large organization that sounds a lot like the one you're working at. You're probably at work frustrated. 
and then to see maybe a similar organization in size or scope, similar tech stack. How did they evolve? How did they move from one piece of tech to another, right? And it looks a little bit like this. Now this definitely looks like a slide, a foundation put together, right? Um, so you start off as a consumer, right? And then we want you to evolve to a participant, right? That's why we focus on having open meetings, open notes, talks like this, right? And then they become a contributor, the critical step. This third step is probably the most important part and the part where we probably are struggling the most historically. And that's why my team exists and we have people who help end users move to this kind of journey so that they can become leaders in the space. And then that leads to not only the tech companies and people like us making this stuff, but the people consuming this stuff over a wide variety of industries, wide variety of use cases. And what does that always lead to? Better software, the more we consume it. So, I love this picture so much because it's just a car, right? And I'm a car nerd, but what I really love about Mercedes, as much as I love this automobile and is a technological marvel, is the way that Mercedes consumes Kubernetes and cloud native. The rest of the people only see this, right? And it's our job to ensure that whatever thing you, whether that's your favorite guitar, I, I don't know if guitar companies are using Kubernetes, but whatever thing out there consumers are, are using and producing, right? A thing you worked on helped that car come to fruition. It's nice, I can't afford that one. Um, so I talked about organizations a little bit. How am I doing on time? When, when am I over? Okay, good. Um, but I wanna talk about the individual. That was the organization. Like I said, two, two parts, two parts. Scratching an individual itch. Uh, this is something I learned from Tim St. Clair uh, when I got into cloud native. He was like, wear your agenda on your sleeve. Uh, we're all here to participate in open source. Everyone has different reasons to participate in open source. Um, but let your colleagues know why you're there, you know? Uh, there's been multiple times where an organization decides, ooh, I wanna join this open source project, and they show up and they open a PR, like you're supposed to, right? And then maintainers say, hey, wait a minute, we're not even going in this direction, right? And how much effort and time has been wasted, especially in the early days, on organizations trying to come into open source you know, and it's like, wow, if they would have said what they needed, you know, I could have hopped on a call and saved them a lot of effort and time. Um, so I would refer to ourselves as our colleagues, right? No matter who you work for. In a way, we're all working together on a common project, Kubernetes, whatever. And I like to think of it as our project wants to be part of your IT team, right? I strive when I see a consumer, whether that's Mercedes or whoever, I'm an end user, I want them to look at us as like, wow, these open source people, they're part of the team, right? We want them to consume this stuff as long as the relationship is equitable. So the pitches help us pool resources together, make an equitable investment in the project, and then in return, we provide you the value, value that is critical into helping organizations succeed, the individual and the organization. So it's about finding your flock, finding that project and this is the part where you go to contribute.cncf.io or come up to me afterwards and say, I actually want to get involved. And it's finding the project that you vibe with. That might be because you use it at work or it's something cool that you read about or it's something that a friend is into, right? I love seeing what other people are into, right? And then finding out how they onboard, right? There's nothing I love more than saying, hi, my name is so-and-so. I tried to get into your project. And we need to talk about your contributing guide. There's nothing that makes me happier than having to go back because as cynical as I am, I'm like, wow, at least you read it. Um, you know, and just didn't go start filing GitHub issues. But uh, the therapy comes later. Um, and mentorship, we invest a lot in mentorship programs and sponsorship programs to get underrepresented people in the door, right? But we need help to ensure that these programs are healthy and staffed. Um, and it's more than just good first issue, right? I like to say, if you wanna get this, hey, if you wanna get it started, you know, we used to say, uh, label your good first issues, right? 
Now you can't even click on anything in GitHub without it reminding you to label things with a good first issue. So we need to evolve past that as well. It's not just, here's a list of good first issues, have a great time. My personal project, I literally do that. Here's a list of good first issues, good luck, right? We might as well just throw them in the pool. So it's not just about that. Do you have an office hours program, right? Are you recording things so you don't have to keep saying the things over and over again? Some resources for you. Every CNCF project holds public meetings. They can be attended by the general uh, populace. When you go on the website, there's a calendar there. It's an iCal. You can subscribe to it. All those meetings are recorded. Uh, the notes are published. We also have YouTube channels, hours and hours and hours and hours of content like this that can help people get started on their journeys. Uh, end user talks, right? More and more you're starting to see the end users themselves and not just the authors of the software talk about how they're using it. And, and all these communication channels, we got too many. Slack, Twitter, oh, I'm already tired, right? There's just so many, there's just so many. Um, and resources for you, we have an entire organization within the CNCF called Tag Contributor Strategy. I call this the home room of getting started. So show up. You'd be surprised at how many people just show up. Hey, I like this tech stack. Where do I go, right? You can hang out here, take a little tour of all the tags, all the SIGs, all of these three-letter acronyms that um, are confusing. Figure out what they are. And then finding... Um, Finding someone to help out, usually it's someone in the same boat, you know, find the buddy next to you. Uh, many of you might work for an organization that has an OSPO, that does have, I almost guarantee your OSPO has a list of stuff that's written down that I was supposed to read but never do because I didn't know it existed. But if you know that your organization has that kind of support staff, I used to love making the VMware OSPO staff work. I got questions for you every day. Um, and your local OSS nerd, you'd be surprised just hanging out at conferences like this um, and what uh, you can get out of it. So your individual reputation and organizational reputation are a thing that you're going to have to manage because you are not your job, right? And yet, I am this job right now, you are this job, and you are this job. So how do we balance the organization and the individual? Because it's not just time in the marketplace, right? The landscape is actually our software, right? And like good little container nerds, we're just used to putting things in neat little boxes, right? And we sometimes forget that it feels like we concentrate on a deployment artifact as our main product of open source when the process of our way of doing software as a business is what's important. And not just the culture, but all of it together, the sum. Um, and the reality is, is that it's not simple. It's an interconnected set of cladograms and food webs. They all have a reason that they exist. Some people spend time wondering why all these things exist and quickly pull out the complexity card, right? They see the CNCF landscape. What a nightmare. I hear you. I hear you. But if you think about the CNCF landscape and the amount of software is out there and the amount of people, the future growth of software, it's actually way simpler than what it's trying to represent, which is all of it. It could be way more complicated. I found this revelation particularly disturbing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we have to realize that some projects are just not gonna make it. Um, the market changes. Things, projects adapt faster than others. Sometimes entire need of software goes away entirely. Sometimes software goes out of, out of favor and then comes back, right? Remember when Go came out? Everyone's like, so long, Python. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> right? Everybody loves Python, right? PyTorch is so cool. What a cool story, right? But you go back a few years ago, you know, and you heard, you heard, oh, no, is that, is that one going to be endangered? Of course not. It's going to be ridiculous. Snakes always, snakes always live forever. Um, <laughs> And some organizations just aren't going to make it as well. So some projects are not going to make it. Some organizations are not going to make it. If you think my next slide is some people are not going to make it, I disagree because projects are just software. Organizations are just those org charts that we keep changing for like no reason. Like I don't understand why they keep changing, right? 
but we can take care of ourselves, the individual. This is one place where we can be the exception because some organisms are truly, truly massive. They're their own ecosystems among themselves, right? The companies, the projects. And when one changes course, it might affect everything around them, AKA a large tech company changed something. I don't know, a license? Oh no, right? And a thing that you liked has changed. And while the old open source knee jerk makes for great hot takes, right? Think about the short term behavior versus the long term sustainability of that organism is what we should be concentrating on. That's the balance that we all need to play. So let me reiterate, organizations who consume and contribute to OSS typically are tied to short term quarter by quarter results because it's about balance. Generally speaking, the ecosystem finds a balance, predator and prey. The population ebbs and flows depending on the resources. As the environment changes, they figure it out, but it's always not so smooth. Disruption of food webs, sometimes even extinction of some species, emergence of an entirely new species or an old one that has adapted to fill a new role, and sometimes new niches arise entirely that need to be filled. So that diversity we see in the landscape can expand at an unchecked rate. It grows based on the resources in that environment. And what's that resource? You. Your food, congratulations. Each project is competing for your attention, competing for your time, for your expertise. And they're starving for you. And that's the reason I give talks like this. Um, so let's look at how they're gonna differentiate themselves because I am running out of time. Um, so each is so unique. I wanna talk about generalization, specialization, and then evolution. Why did Carnotaurus make it and not others, specifically in this period in time? Cretaceous Madagascar. Technically, he didn't make it, but he had a great run. We sometimes forget that the entirety of human existence is but a sliver in this life cycle of this entire species. Um, but a related did, creature didn't make it. Why not? This, this guy's so cool. Um, I'm going to talk about generalization. This is basically a cow, generally a simple creature. Eats basic stuff. You feed it developers, and it produces productive output. Databases, relatively simple software, or is it? Um, and yet, databases started off as generalists, but also so sophisticated. Generalized creatures are popular. There's millions of them, right? And once plants took over the planet, something was going to eat those plants, right? And then there's lots of plants. So we ended up with lots of things that eat plants and then things that eat those things. And yet, the deeper you dig into databases, the more complex they get. What? It gets so complicated that some databases move away from generalization and become highly specialized to fill those roles, but without generalized databases, the modern world can't function either. And because of the pressures of competition for natural resources is always extreme, the animals in the projects adapt to take advantage of every opportunity to succeed and move on. So it ends up being about risk management for the people, the project, and the organization. When you adapt to take advantage of an opportunity, you're more at risk to the environment changing. This therizinosaur adapted to using those huge claws to pull vegetation down from trees so it could eat, right? This worked out for it because it grew to be an amazingly large creature, an expensive strategy for an animal. Those are biologically expensive to grow, right? Similarly, those horns on those carnotaurs serve a purpose that we don't fully yet understand, but are biologically expensive to grow. So similarly, animals have to maintain things that they might not fully understand. That might be a comment on tech debt or not. I'm not sure, let me know. What an odd look a creature just called the Dinochirus? Who would design this, a specific environment designed this? Like look at this, what is this, a duck? I don't, like what is the, like what is this? It's so weird, right? This creature is perfectly adapted to the environment that it, that it adapted itself to, some swamp. Can you imagine what eats this? I don't know. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and skip ahead here because that as it turns out, it's this unity and diversity of life that brings this robustness to this ecosystem. Um, and you might have heard this before, there are 14 standards, and now there's 15 is one way to look at it. Indeed, having a well set of defined APIs, standards are important. But as a famous Kubernetes system engineer once told me, life finds a way.yaml. There's that nuance between well-defined APIs and it allows an ecosystem to spring forth, right, while giving projects the flexibility to innovate and solve those problems for people. 
So this is Spinosaurus aegypticus. Went extinct, the longest land predator to ever exist. Went extinct 30 million years before T. rex even existed. Right? But if you were to observe it, you wouldn't know that creature was going extinct. Right? We're always focused on that big extinction event, the drama, right? This, this exact part of that project's life cycle. Sometimes we forget that it's about the long term. So it's about evolution. One thing we do know is that when you look at the fossil record, when there is a large shift in an ecosystem, nature goes into evolutionary overdrive. The pace of change accelerate. Niches fill quickly. Those who move the fastest move on, and those that don't, don't cycle out, right? Um, AI has changed everything. I can't even, you can't even go to this conference without hearing about AI, right? That is a, that is a force that is forcing us to evolve. So how, how, I, how much am I doing on time? When, when's the next start? Okay, good, thank you. I started my timer late, sorry about that. But yet, some designs stand the test of time. Diversity around a basic body plan could totally work and has worked. Sharks have been around since before the dinosaurs, after the dinosaurs. There's just so many different kinds of sharks in every single niche, every single depth of the ocean. The next time you go to a zoo or an aquarium, check on the diversity of some of these creatures and how they have adapted themselves. Same basic body plan. Databases can kind of, kind of be like sharks, don't you think? I don't know, you tell me. So it's all about that adaptability. We're entering that new chapter. We find ourselves in an environment when open source value is being underestimated. And as the next generation, I'm challenging you to learn the lessons of my generation, but not box yourself in to our, to our dogmatic views. Be your own animal, a generational leap of contributors. That also doesn't mean don't learn our lessons. What it means takes our lessons and figure it out together as a community. Because being great engineers, marketers, project managers, contributors, and maintainers is great, but what we really need to be are ecologists. We need to be the ones explaining not just how the software works, but how that ecosystem works and why bringing in that software in brings value to that organization. And on top of that, sorry, you got to learn to be an economist a little bit. I hate it. I'm reading stuff that is so boring. It's driving me nuts. There is no escape. You're going to have to hang out with salespeople. There's just nothing I can't change. I can't change that. So dinosaurs as a group didn't make it except for one, Aves, which eventually became some of the most beautiful creatures on our planet. Top predators until we came around. They used to eat us, by the way. That's a different talk. Um, if you're a creature in the ecosphere of a harpy eagle, you know it. <laughs> um, but yeah, until we came along, but that's a story for another day. So in conclusion, some people will always consume open source without understanding it. Totally fine. Buy your cool dinosaurs, go play, have a great time. Charge as much as you want for those dinosaurs. Ding! Consumers want their tech in a big bag of dinosaurs. They don't want to care about any of that stuff. They want to go to Jurassic Park and be entertained. Right? And that's fine. But as stewards of these ecosystems, we're the ones that have to be the scientists. So you're probably expecting a slide with the asteroid that comes at the end and, you know, oh, no, we figure out we're all going to die. No, that's just a little bit too dark. I did have a version of the talk like that. Probably not, not what uh, the staff was looking for here. But here's the message I want to leave you with today. We're watching this happen in real time. We know that we, it is difficult for us to observe these projects ourselves and these organizations without that context of deep time. So we need to know that and remember that bias that we have. Your homework assignment, ha <laughs> Engineers, help explain to your managers, wow, quote, wow, that would have been expensive to implement by ourselves, you know? Luckily, I, I did the homework and I checked, here the other organization is doing it. Bam, here's that slide deck from George that doesn't exist that talks about the economic values of doing it this way. Managers, you have a harder job. You need to collate this information and present it in a way that makes sense to your business. And maintainers, you have the toughest job of all. I'm sorry, you will always have the toughest job of all. You must care for these creatures while justifying the investment to the previous two groups. This is hard and part of a larger conversation that I hope we continue to discuss as a community. So we're tour guides, we're the naturalists. When you watch a documentary on the BBC, you can tell that David Attenborough considered his job to educate 
an entire generation of people of the importance of the natural world that we live in. So in a way, we need to act that way. We need to be those stewards, and we need to take ownership of that, and that can be very difficult, especially since we collectively own these things, you know? Um, so now it's up to us to catalog and ensure each of your beautiful cloud-native projects finds its place and thrives, and find your place and thrive. And if at any time you're feeling lost, confused, or don't know where to start, people like me, ooh, people like me, people like Jeremy, people like Kara, we care very deeply about ensuring that you succeed in this industry. And with that, thank you very much. Do I have any questions? I think I got five minutes, four minutes. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's all I got. I love this thing. I had this commission by an artist who does dinosaurs, and I wanted someone that was beautiful yet can bite your face off when you, <laughs> when you mess with the, with the thing. A any questions at all? Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. I'm around uh, all week, and uh, with that, thank you. <laughs>